Well, folks, in today's video, we're going to be starting construction on a brand new layout. Basically, a while back, a family friend reached out to me and said that they wanted to get their son into model railroading, so they asked if I'd be willing to build them a layout, and I agreed to it because, frankly, any chance I get to build a layout, I'll pretty much take it. So, uh, over that time period, I've basically just been collecting different supplies, kind of laying them out and coming up with different ideas, and I've landed on something which I feel pretty good about. I've drawn it all out here, which is how I've built the last two layouts I have. This isn't necessarily the best way to plan a layout, but this is how I've built the last two and I'm pretty happy with the results. Sometimes I find you just need to get little bits of inspiration here and there and just kind of draw it all out. And generally when you're working with a 4x8, it will fit most of what you want. So even though, you know, these dimensions might not be perfect, with the right track, we can probably build this pretty well. Anyways, this layout features two different sets of tracks. We've got this track right here, which will follow the perimeter on the layout. It's going to be just a very basic main line, which I find is a good thing to have. And then in this area, it will actually link up with a second line. And I know it looks like there are three sets of tracks, and there kind of is, but these are actually both the same line. They just overlap each other, which is a pretty old design. I've seen that on some other layouts. So I decided to incorporate that into this one just because it's going to make it look like more is going on. We'll be able to put some hills, bridges, things like that, which I find make any layout more exciting. And uh, overall, it should leave us room to uh, add a village with a spur and a bunch of other things. So I think that this should be pretty good. Anyways, we're going to start by just taking these various supplies I have, laying them all out, making sure we have enough track, and then uh, if we get it laid out, we'll pin it down and we'll begin actually putting everything together. So let's get started. So we're gonna start off by just loosely laying out all this track. And what I've got right here is some Atlas Snap Track, and this is Code 100 Nickel Silver. I highly recommend going with Code 100 Track because the thicker rails will allow you to run older equipment with larger flanges, which is really important in my opinion. And I highly recommend that you go with Nickel Silver Track too, because it just conducts far better than brass and steel track do. It does cost a little bit more, but honestly, I think it's worth it just because it doesn't matter what you're running, it will work way better with this, especially if you want to use DCC, definitely go with nickel silver. It will save you some pain in the long run. Now, this track right here is 22 radius, which is pretty much the widest you can go with on a four foot wide layout. I always recommend going with the widest radius possible just because it doesn't matter what equipment you run on it. The wider the curves, the less strain it will put on the train. So uh, yeah, definitely go with 24s if you can make your layout a little bit wider. But for this four foot wide layout, 22s should be pretty good for the outside. Now, obviously for the inside, we're gonna have to supplement with some 18 radius and this stuff's fine um, the majority of equipment will work on this it's just going to strain uh, certain locomotives a little more and uh, some larger steam engines and stuff might have a tendency to derail a little more on 18s but they should be okay for this so anyways now that we've got that out of the way we'll start putting this all together
So with everything roughly laid out, I think it's time to add in the incline set. This is a uh, thing you can buy from Woodland Scenics, which uh, basically sets the grade to a certain amount because you could build hills with cardboard and so on, but this will just guarantee that they're, you know, an even slope. I picked 4%, which is the steepest, which I think for the size of layout should be okay. And uh, for anybody who's curious, they cost around uh, 22 Canadian dollars. So probably a little bit cheaper if you're watching this from the States. Anyways, let's get these things out of the boxes and on the layout. Well, it's now a little while later, and I'm really happy with how this is all starting to come along. It's really starting to look like an actual train layout and not just a pile of supplies and tracks, so that's all great. I did a little bit of work off camera. It was mostly just uh, doing small adjustments with the track. Not terribly exciting stuff. One larger thing I did, though, was get this whole area sorted out. Trying to get these two sets of tracks to negotiate around each other was way more challenging than I was expecting just because of the angle that this track's kind of coming in at and uh, the bridge and everything else, and I couldn't really push this any further back to get the grade to the right height, so I actually had to, like, lop off a section of the foam and add it right here. But it works now. You can see that even the biggest car can kind of dance between uh, the two uh, mounds for the track. So that's really what's important here. So I think at this point, what I want to do is I want to take some pins and kind of pin down all the track, maybe solder a few joiners here and there just to keep it all together. And then we'll just try to kind of get the foam uh, or the uh, cork roadbed under the track. And uh, I think that that should work pretty well. And I'll show you why in a sec. But anyways, uh, let's begin on just getting the pins in place. So what we're going to be using to tack the track down are not actual spikes, but these little pins. I actually bought these at a dollar store, and uh, I think that artists use them just to kind of hold things in place while they're working on stuff. But I find they work really well for track, because uh, the problem with the actual spikes is that they're so short that once you try to get the roadbed under here, uh, they won't actually reach the foam very well, and they'll just kind of come loose. So we're going to be using these. They'll work great. And I'm only going to pin them... I'd say about halfway because we want there to be enough room that we can lift the track up and actually get the roadbed under here. And again, I'll show you in a little bit why that's important. But for now, I just want to uh, kind of focus on getting all the track together. Now, what's really important is that the joiners are, you know, nice and uh, snug together. But also run your fingers over the tops of the rails because sometimes a joiner will go under one rail and uh, it will create a bump and that's no good. You have to make sure that your track is perfectly even. And again, to the eye, it's hard to see, but uh, I always suggest just run your fingers over all the joints and make sure that they're all good. And with that, we'll begin uh, just kind of nailing all this down.
seems about right on the money. Now I just need to fill in this section. So with all the track all pinned down, I think that everything's good enough to actually start putting down the cork road bed. Now, uh, this one comes from uh, Midwest Productions. I think there are other brands of cork out there, but this is just what they had at my local hobby store. You can also buy uh, sheets of cork at the hardware store, which is probably a good way to save some money. But this stuff's pretty nice because it's pretty much all ready to go. So I just take this stuff, split it down the middle. And then uh, we're going to try to work the two uh, pieces kind of under the track. I highly recommend uh, going with cork road bed over foam. It's just a little bit more firm and stable. I know a lot of people that, uh, or a lot of businesses that sell foam road bed will claim that it dampens noise uh, better than cork. But uh, personally, I don't find it actually makes a difference because the truth is, you know, we're going to be ballasting all this track. So once you put ballast down on your track, any noise dampening advantages that foam has are gone and uh, this stuff's way more stable. So definitely go with cork. Now those spikes we added earlier are going to help us kind of guide the cork. Obviously, since I put glue on here, it's going to kind of go everywhere, but that's okay. This is the base phase of the layout, so it doesn't really matter. You see those nails actually keep the foam uh, dead center, which is exactly what we want.
So it's now the next day. I let the glue dry overnight, so the road bed is nice and secure now. So I think at this point, all we need to do is hook some sort of a controller up to this thing and start running some trains and see how it goes. We're probably gonna have to do some troubleshooting. That's pretty common, because uh, despite you know already checking out all this track work visually, there's almost always some little issues and that's okay because of course it's all just pinned down right now so we can make tons of small adjustments as needed. So let's go grab a controller and start running some trains for the first time. All right, so we got my trusty lifelike controller and uh, a junky old Atherin Blue Box locomotive. I paid $5 for this thing. It's perfect for testing out track just because if something goes wrong, uh, this engine will almost certainly survive. Anyways, let's get our controller all uh, attached here. All right, well, through a sketchy tactic, I've got us all wired in here, so time for a moment of truth. Will the layout work? Let's see what happens. Well, the locomotive's moving, that's a good start. Yeah. All right, well, so far that doesn't seem too bad. Let's set it around for two laps. Okay, wow. No problems. All right, now time for the real moment of truth. Let's see how the inner circuit is. I got through those switches, no problem. Oh. Okay. Uh, I missed a bit of a nail there. Going through there. Clearly missed a couple more nails than I thought. Yeah. Let's see if it will get through here again. Yeah, it rerailed itself. All right, let's try here again. Eh, it derailed again. And we lost the bridge. Okay, then. <laughs> so honestly, for a first run that didn't seem all that bad, the outer circuit was pretty much perfect. The inner one was not so good. I missed a few nails, but moreover, uh, this section of track seems to be a little bit problematic. Uh, the bridge came down. I'm not too surprised that was a little bit loose while I was working on it, so I kind of figured something like that might happen. So I think I'm going to replace that with something else. But the bigger issue is that I made a bit of a mistake here because as I mentioned earlier, I lopped off part of the foam here. I added it on here, but I forgot that of course there's no incline between here. So this piece of track is flat and then it goes back into another incline and then into a decline immediately and it just creates this really kind of sharp edge which is no good so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to even out this section of track so that we kind of add an incline like that which you can see is really how it should have been built in the beginning and then i'm going to uh, solder up these rail joiners so that we can make those flat as well and i think that that will fix this problem I went and found this. It's basically the exact same bridge, but you see how it's not all messed up on the end here? I think that that is gonna work to our advantage here. All right, well, we'll see if that made any difference. Yeah, that's more like it.
Very nice. Well, we'll let that go around a few times and then uh, we'll see if anything derails. And if nothing derails, then we'll uh, try running things in the other direction. Because obviously that can make a pretty big difference. Well, that seems pretty good to me. Let's try taking it back out on the uh, main line here. Well, I think that those results are pretty satisfactory. <laughs> Do we dare? I think so. Just to be clear, I do expect this one to have some problems, but uh, we'll, we'll try it out just for kicks. Okay, so the bridge, not wide enough for the big boy. <laughs> I actually made it through those switches, I'm amazed. Okay, here's the really daring part. Wow. Okay, this is going to be the real challenge, this kind of S-curve here. My goodness, it's going right around, even through the 18 radius. Wow. Well, I don't know what to say other than that I'm really impressed. I really didn't think that the big boy could handle the turns and hills on this layout, but here it is going around, which is kind of remarkable because it was just a little while ago it couldn't even handle this basic diesel locomotive, and here it is with the world's largest steam engine. But I think that this is just a terrific sign that we've got the track work pretty good so far. Uh, I mean, if it can handle this locomotive, it's going to be able to handle pretty much any locomotive you ever want to throw at it. And uh, hopefully that will mean this layout will be able to provide many years of joy without too many derailments, which really always is the goal. So yeah, couldn't ask for better results. Well, folks, I think that that's going to be it for today's video. I hope you all enjoyed. I am certainly happy with the results. I mean, we started this with a pile of supplies, and now we've got a working layout, and it can even handle a Union Pacific big boy, apparently. So, yeah, fantastic. There's definitely going to be more videos on this. We're going to be doing some scenery and other stuff. But at least we've got the track work down, and with a little bit of troubleshooting, I think that we can turn this into an absolutely terrific layout. So until the next one, I just want to thank you all so much for watching.